then uh, so uh, hello to my students or hello to all the listeners now we will be discussing this uh, another uh, competency the competency is 10.7 it says that describe and discuss functions of cerebral cortex basal ganglia thalamus hypothalamus cerebellum and limbic system and their abnormalities the, all the competencies are being grouped in the same uh, uh, single competencies otherwise they uh, so we'll be discussing one by one the sensory cortex we have already previously discussed now today i'll be taking up the thalamus so rest of the uh, components of this uh, competency will be taken up one by one so let's start with this what are the different specific learning objectives of this uh, lecture of thalamus so as usual i repeat that at the end of session phase 1 mbbs student should be able to so what you should be able to is that you should be able to discuss the physiological anatomy of thalamus this is very very important until unless you know the physiological anatomy of thalamus you not be able to make out for the functions of thalamus so why i'm using this word physiological anatomy because anatomy you will be dealing or studying in the thalamus but whatever anatomy is related to the physiology part i'll be dealing here then enumerate and discuss different thalamic nuclei you need to know the names as well as you need to know the different thalami thalamic nuclei what are their locations what are their names what are their functions and what are their connections next the connections of thalamus properly you should be able to trace the connections of thalamus properly again this is very important the incoming connections the outgoing that is the efferents and efferents should be known to you also then explain the importance of thalamus appropriately so why do we want to have the thalamus why we have thalamus that is the functions of thalamus should be known to you then last but not the least you should be able to relate the applied aspect of thalamus to its functions correctly that whatever the conditions or whatever the abnormalities are occur because of thalamus you should be able to know and what is the physiological basis of these abnormalities you should be able to tell and you should be able to understand so that in future you can be you becomes important for you and helps you to become a indian medical graduate so uh, the topic for today is thalamus so what is a thalamus why do we call this structure as thalamus this is the thalamus thalamus is derived from the greek meaning that is the inner chamber it lies inside the uh, brain and it's a midline structure it's a mid symmetrical structure that is we have two thalami on each side in the brain and this is situated between the cerebral cortex and the mid brain so it lies between the mid brain and the cerebral cortex so uh, why do we need to have a thalamus we have two thalami on each side of the midline why do we need to have thalamus thalamus is an important relay center for not only for the sensory uh, sensations but also the motor signals of the cerebral cortex that is all the sensations or the signals which are going to the cerebral cortex which are going to the cerebral cortex they have to pass through the thalamus that is all the sensations coming from the spinal cord from the brain stem mm -hmm. they have to pass through the thalamus and then reach the different parts of the cortex so it means that it is a relay center and it's sort of a gatekeeper of the brain it is considered as a gatekeeper of the brain almost here the sensations not only reach here but they are also processed here so there is processing like there is a router it's like a router so it acts as a router it receives the data from the lower centers the spinal cord brain stem 
it receives the reticular formation of the brain stem and it receives this data processes some of the data and then sends the data to an appropriate parts of the cerebral cortex and moreover some of the information from the cortex reaches the thalamus and here again the processing occurs and then it go, goes back to the cerebral cortex that is the cortical thalamo cortical signals so it not only plays the relay center for all the sensations uh, almost all the sensations except for olfactory sensations and also the motor sensation and it has a important role to play in your language in your memory and in your sleep wakeful cycle as we studied in the previous lectures about the reticular formation so reticular formation or reticular activating systems maintain the consciousness it keeps us alert and awake awake it is with the help of the this thalamus so the thalamic signals as well as the signals from these reticular activating system they come together and make uh, keep us awake and alert so we will be studying this thalamus and let's start with this so thalamus is a part of diencephalon diencephalon that we have so in the diencephalon what are the structures included in the diencephalon they are the thalamus proper ventral thalamus epithalamus and hypothalamus i'll not go much of the detail in the anatomy part but whatever is related to the physiology part i'll be going to three through it now before going further you need to have certain points into consideration you should think about the physiological anatomy so before going to the physiological anatomy a few points you should understand and remember what are those few points that the thalamus proper the dorsal thalamus which we earlier labeled the part as dorsal thalamus is now called the thalamus proper that is whenever we say thalamus it means we are talking of dorsal thalamus so we don't say now dorsal thalamus we say just thalamus now earlier which was called as ventral thalamus is now called as subthalamus so when we say subthalamus previously it was known as ventral thalamus then we have the reticular nucleus of the thalamus which is functionally the part of ventral thalamus but it is a component of the thalamus functionally it is a part of sub -thal ventral thalamus or the subthalamus then subthalamic nucleus is studied along with the basal ganglion as functionally it is a part of the basal ganglia although it is named as subthalamus previously it was ventral thalamus but functionally it belongs to basal ganglia then another two important structures are the medial and the lateral geniculate bodies they are the integral part of the dorsal thalamus earlier they were considered distinct from the other regions of the thalamus but now they have been grouped together in this thalamus so if we see here this is the thalamus again i repeat mid in between the mid mid brain and the cerebral cortex see this is the cut section of the brain we can see the thalamus here the hypothalamus below this then pituitary gland here then the this is the cingulate gyrus and this is the corpus callosum the fibers which connect the two cerebral hemispheres thalamus is a ovoid structure thalamus is a ovoid structure egg shaped structure it's a collection of neurons it's a basically contains more and more of the gray matter and uh, lies as i said at the top of the midbrain forming the medial boundary of it forms the medial boundary of the internal uh, capsule and it forms the medial boundary of the internal capsule and the lateral boundary of the third ventricle lateral boundary of the third ventricle so 
if you see this cut section of this brain portion of the brain here this is the medial portion of the thalami one thalami so here we can see the anterior end of the thalamus lies just behind and below the interventricular foramen this is the interventricular foramen when where the two ventricles are connected well, then the posterior end or posterior pole is known as expanded this see if you see this is expanded and this is called as the it pulvinar it is called as the pulvinar it lies just above the superior colliculus it lies just above the superior colliculus lies above and lateral to the superior colliculus not the dorsal or superior surface the superior surface it for it is convex if you see you can see this is convex and triangle it's slightly convex in outline and it forms the floor of the it forms the floor of the eye of the central part of the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle lateral ventricle and this is the ventral or the inferior surface of the thalamus it is related to the hypothalamus see we can see here it is the hypothalamus this is the hypothalamus so the the hypothalamus hypothalamus and the uh, this uh, thalamus they are separated by a hypothalamic sulcus so this medial surface is separated by a from the hypothalamus by the hypothalamic surface this medial surface if you see the medial surface the medial surface to the medial surface there will be a midline there will be midline and then this and there will in the midline it will be connected to the other thalamus those the other thalami which are connected by in the center of the two there will be short bar of the gray matter called the interthalamic adhesions interthalamic adhesions so some of the nuclei they lie in this interthalamic adhesions so if you approximate two thalami together in between there is a collection of the gray matter by which the two thalami are connected they are called as interthalamic adhesions and in between this interthalamic adhesions there is presence of the midline nuclei there is a presence of the midline thalamic nuclei which we will be studying later on this medial surface forms basically the part of the lateral wall of the third ventricle lined by ependyma the lateral surface if we go if we see the 3d picture lateral surface is related to the posterior limb of the internal capsule related to the posterior limb of the internal capsule then uh, if we uh, see if you uh, try to see the thalamus from out the thalamus is Uh, let's see first talk of this the thalamus as i told you contains mainly the gray matter it's a collection of neurons but the thalamus if you open up the thalamus we see that in the center there is the uh, thin layer of y shaped sheet of white matter which is placed vertically it's y shaped and it separates the uh, the thalamus into three components the anterior medial and the lateral so that is why the nuclei present in these structures known as anterior thalamic nuclei these are known as medial thalamic nuclei and the lateral thalamic nuclei and there are other subgroups of the nuclei this internal medullary lamina it is made up of the internuclear thalamic connection so these nuclei they are interconnected with each other they send the signals and they send the uh, connections to each other and this is forms the internal medullary lamina this is thalamus is also covered by a layer of white matter covering the especially the lateral surface the lateral surface of the thalamus and it is made up of thalamocortical fibers and the corticothalamus fibers that is the thalamus fibers going from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex and from coming to the cortex to the thalamic fibers that is the cortico that is the thalamocortical fibers and the corticothalamic fibers from the outside and then there is another nucleus which is a reticular part of the thalamic nucleus which lies outside so this external medullary lamina the external medullary lamina it separates the lateral surface of the thalamus from the reticular nuclei so so now we are clear about the uh, different uh, divisions of the thalamus i again clear myself that the thalamus there is a anterior uh, again repeat anteriorly anterior end is below 
and behind the interventricular foramen posterior end is expanded and is known as pulvinar it lies just above and lateral to the superior collicular then the inferiorly separated from the hypothalamus by the hypothalamic sulcus medially it forms the boundary of the third ventricle the two thalami they are connected to each other by a interthalamic additions in which are present the the midline nuclei then the ventral or the this uh, dorsal or the superior surface is convex it forms part of the floor of the lateral ventricle and then the thalamus is divided by the fibers which are connecting the different thalamic nuclei into three components the interior medial and lateral and uh, likewise the nuclei present in these areas are known as anterior nuclei thalamic nuclei medial thalamic nuclei lateral thalamic nuclei and this fibers interthalamic fibers these which divide in the uh, the thalamus into three components is in the y shaped and it is known as internal medullary lamina then you have on the lateral surface another uh, layer of the white matter which is known as inter uh, external medullary lamina which is formed by the thalamocortical and corticothalamic fibers it separates this uh, lateral surface of the thalamus from the reticular nuclei which of the thalamus which are present in outside the external medullary lamina now let's move to the anatomy of uh, thalamus and so as we were saying that it is a mass of gray matter thalamus is a mass of gray matter full of nuclei so these nuclei they are classified as per the anatomical classification then we have a physiological or the functional classification a greater uh, part of this anatomy will be taught in the anatomy classes but let me give a idea of the anatomical classification so that you are able to see exactly the location of these nuclei so when we are talking of functional classification and the functions of nuclei in the connections you are clear what are they so as i told you earlier that the thalamus is uh, in the if you cut open the thalamus it is divided into three components by the internal medullary lamina this is the interior part and this is the medial part and this is the lateral part and as i told you earlier that this internal medullary lamina are basically the fibers or the white fibers or the these are the axons of the different thalami which can axon and then right of the thalami which connect to each other and this then by and this also divides the thalamus into three components now uh, first of all we have this anterior medullary uh, anterior group in the anterior group you have a single nucleus which is the anterior nucleus if you say this is the anterior part of the thalamus and this is the posterior part so in the anterior part the uh, lamina divides into, into anterior group and this here is present the anterior nucleus then we have the medial group in the medial group we have multiple nuclei and one very important aspect is if you consider this is a lateral part of one thalamus as you know that we are we have two thalami and they are uh, separated by a third ventricle and then you have at the upper portion they are connected to each other by intrathalamic adhesion and what is this intrathalamic adhesion this intrathalamic adhesion is basically made up of gray matter and this gray matter has certain nuclei which are considered to be the part of the part of the uh, new thalamus the nuclear considered the part of the thalamic nuclei so now in this medial group we have the dorsomedial nucleus this dorsomedial nucleus is present over here then we have the midline nuclei now the midline nuclei the nuclei which are present in this intrathalamic adhesion which connects the two thalami are known as the midline nuclei so these are known as midline nuclei as the name itself suggests midline means they are present in the mid then this internal medullary lamina it is not only made of the fibers but it has certain interspersed group of scattered nuclei also and these nuclei are known as intralaminar nuclei you can remember it because they are present in the lamina so they are called as intralaminar nuclei and one of the important nuclei of this nucleus of the central laminar is the largest one centro median nucleus then we have the lateral group lateral group is very large it is again divided into two portions we have the ventral group and when we have the dorsal group in the ventral group ventral group there is a 
ventral anterior nucleus which is anteriorly placed then we have the ventral lateral nucleus which is laterally placed but it is in the anterior portion ventral portion then we have another very important nucleus which is the ventro posterior nucleus or the postero ventral nucleus or what we called as ventro basal complex again repeat ventro basal complex this nucleus has further divided into two nuclei ventro posterior lateral and ventro posterior medial nucleus this is a very important nuclear almost all the nucleus nuclei are very important and this is the one of the important nuclei again repeat the ventral nuclei uh, ventro posterior lateral posterior uh, ventro posterior nucleus or the ventro basal complex is divided into ventro posterior lateral ventro posterior medial then we have two collection of nuclei which is slightly in the lower portion but in the ventral they are considered to be the part of the ventral group they are the medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body earlier they were not considered to be the part of the thalamus but now it has been very clear they are grouped in the thalamus then we have the dorsal group the lateral group has the dorsal group nuclei also uh, he, here we have three nuclei the lateral dorsal the lateral posterior and then the pulvinar which is a posterior flattened portion of the thalamus I again repeat lateral dorsal lateral posterior and pulvinar once again i repeat myself we have the anterior nucleus in the anterior group we have the dorsomedial nucleus then we have the mid midline nucleus then we have the intralaminar nucleus in the medial group and we have the ventral group nuclei and the dorsal group nuclei in the uh, lateral group in the ventral group we have the ventro anterior ventro lateral and uh, ventro posterior which is further divided into ventro posterior lateral ventro posterior medial we have medic medial geniculate body lateral geniculate body and in the dorsal group we have the lateral dorsal lateral posterior pulvinar so a total of total of five nuclei in the ventral group one two three four and five again repeat total of five nuclei in the ventral group one ventro anterior ventro lateral ventro posterior and lateral genclate body medial genclate body three in the dorsal group pulvinar lateral posterior lateral dorsal three in the medial group dorsal medial midline and then the intralaminar intralaminar is basically made of collection of nuclei and then we have it is not mentioned over here is that we have another collection of nuclei which is known as the reticular nuclei because if you remember is that this if you remember that is another external medullary lamina which separates the thalamus from a group of nuclei which are present over here which is the lateral group of nuclei but reticular group of nuclei this external medullary lamina is made up of the fibers which is a thalamocortical and corticothalamic fibers so this is also a reticular group is another which is not exactly grouped into some group but there is definitely the presence of the reticular group of nuclei now we are clear how the nuclei are classified anatomically in thalamus now this is another classification which is the functional classification or what we called as the physiological classification as per the functional classification we have the nuclei thalamic nuclei grouped in two groups one is the specific projection nuclei and the second is non specific projection nuclei the name itself is very clear that is the exactly where the nucleus project nuclei project specific projection nuclei non specific they are non specific they are not very clear there is a uh, not very much clarity about their projection part so they are known as non specific projection nuclei in the specific projection nuclei these nuclei are again grouped depending upon their function they are again grouped into four groups what is number 1 is specific sensory relay nuclei then we have the visceral efferent control nuclei third is motor control nuclei and then we have another group is association nuclei i again repeat myself the specific projection nuclei are divided into specific sensory relay nuclei if you 
see clearly the name it is specific it receives mostly the sensory signals it is a relay center so specific sensory relay nuclei then you have the visceral efferent control nuclei which play a role in the control of uh, viscera then you have the motor control nuclei which play some role in the motor control and then lastly the association nuclei now these nuclei these four groups of nuclei 1 2 3 4 are again further divided into different groups depending upon the function of the nuclei in the specific sensory nuclei we have the ventral posterior nucleus and then we have the medial geniculate body and we have the lateral geniculate body if you remember this ventral posterior nuclei and the medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body they belong to the to the ventral group ventral group of the lateral part of the thalamus if you remember we had the in the anatomy classification we have the anterior group we have the medial group we have the lateral group so they belong to the ventral part of the lateral group we have the ventral posterior nucleus or what we called as ventro basal complex which is further divided into ventro posterior lateral and ventro posterior medial nucleus and then we have the medial geniculate body and then we have the lateral geniculate body the visceral efferent control nuclei are again further have two collection of nuclei one is the anterior nucleus which belongs to the anterior group then you have the dorsal medial nucleus which is the from the medial group of the anatomical classification the if you remember the nucleus the dorsal medial nucleus so visceral efferent nuclei control nuclei are made up of collection of two nuclei the anterior nucleus and dorsal medial nucleus then the motor control nuclei they are the basically the part of the lateral group ventral part of the lateral group that is the ventral lateral nucleus and ventral anterior nucleus you can remember them they are the part of the ventral group ventral lateral nucleus and ventral anterior nucleus then association nuclei they belong to the dorsal group of lateral group dorsal part dorsal group of the lateral nuclei of the anatomical classification so these are all lateral nuclei these are also the lateral nuclei these are also the lateral nuclei these are also the mainly the lateral nuclei so in the association nuclei we have the pulvinar nucleus the flattened portion of the thalamus and we have the lateral posterior nucleus we have the dorsal lateral nucleus again repeat the specific projection nuclei in this the most of the nuclei they belong to either the uh, thus either the medial group or the mainly the uh, lateral group and some and uh, mainly the anterior group and some also are of the medial group specific sensory relay nuclei the motor control nuclei the association nuclei they all belong to the lateral group and the visceral efferent control nuclei it belongs to the anterior anterior group as well as part of the midline group then we have the non specific projection nuclei if you see the non specific projection nuclei they belong they are basically the median nuclei and then we talked of reticular nuclei also so they are the reticular nuclei also so intralaminar nuclei present in the internal medullary lamina and centro medial nuclei some people they take it as a separate nuclei but it is a part of the intralaminar nuclei and then we have the midline nuclei which is present in the interlaminar adhesion or the gray matter and then we have the reticular nuclei which is present slightly outside the new thalamus but part of the thalamus separated by the external medullary lamina now one by one we'll be talking about the different functional nuclei first of all let us take the specific projection nuclei and their connections in the specific projection nuclei first of all there is specific sensory relay nuclei that is the first order nuclei or what they receive the specific sensory who receive the specific sensory signals and then pass on to the cerebral cortex 
In this, first of all, there is ventro-basal complex. Ventro-basal complex, if you see this, this is the portion which is called as ventro-basal complex or other name for this is posterior-ventral group or posterior-ventral group or the ventral-posterior nucleus. So, this is present in the ventral portion of the lateral group. This is the lateral part of the thalamus. It is present in the ventral portion of the lateral group. So, this is posterior ventral or the ventral posterior nucleus. This is one of the main sensory nucleus of the thalamus. This is further divided into or this is further uh, has two components. One is the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and the other is ventral posterior posterior medial nucleus. So, the two nuclei which are included in this ventro basal complex are the ventral posterior, posterior lateral nucleus and the ventral posterior medial nucleus. The efferents uh, which come to these nuclei or which they uh, act as a relay center are from the medial lemniscal system which receives its input from the posterior column pathways and also from the spinothalamic tracts. If you remember when we talked of the ascending tract, we said that the spinothalamic tracts and the uh, posterior column tracts, they finally ended in the v ventrobasal complex, so VPL nucleus of the ventrobasal complex. So, all the sensations of touch, pressure, pain, proprioceptive, temperature, all the kinesthetic sensations, that is the sensation of position and um, movement from whole body except the face is received by the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. So, these first order neurons they receive the impulses from uh, middle lemniscal system and spinothalamic tracts. Then the uh, ventral posterior medial nucleus it also receives the similar sort of uh, somatos uh, sensory sensations uh, similar sort of sensations that is touch, pressure, pain, temperature, kinesthetic sensations. Uh, like that of uh, position and movement, but these are from the face and also it receives in addition to that the special sensation of taste. So, this is carried by the trigeminal lemniscus and then, then it is relayed in the first order neurons which is the posterior posterior middle neurons. Now, these neurons via its thalamocortical projections, they relay to the sensory cortex which is a post central gyrus area 3, 1, 2 these nuclei ventrobasal complex also receives fibers from the corticothalamic corticothalamic fibers from the cerebral cortex especially the layer 4 of the cerebral cortex so and it relays in the layer uh, uh, 4 of the sensory cortex post which is present in the post central gyrus area 3 1 2 and also receives the uh, efferents from the cortex its layer 6 now if you see this this is the ventrobasal complex. It has again repeat, it has two nuclei ventroposterior nuclei, ventroposterior lateral, ventroposterior medial. The, the spinothalamic tracts end over here, and also the medial lemniscal system, which is basically the tract formed from posterior column pathways. It carries all the and the trigeminal lemniscus. It ends in the ventroposterior medial nucleus, and they both of them carry the sensation of a touch. So, the uh, touch, pressure, pain, proprioceptive, temperature, kinesthetic sensations from the whole body here, from the face along with the taste here and finally the also from the cortex here and then the efferents go to the sensory cortex that is the area 3, 1, 2, layer 5. So, this is ventrobasal complex is one of the main sensory nucleus of the thalamus and it basically acts as a relay centers for all the main sensations of touch, pressure, pain, proprioceptive, temperature, taste and kinesthetic sensation based on movement. The second sensory specific sensory nuclei is the medial geniculate body. If we, medial genital body or what we call MGM, it is uh, MGB, it is the auditory, uh, mainly concerned with the auditory sensations and it receives auditory fibers which are mainly come from, which mainly uh, 
by the lateral uh, by the inferior colliculi and also some fibers by the inferior this lateral lemniscus uh, basically the fibers from the ear fibers from the ear the the cochlear fibers from the ear they relay cochlear nerve fibers from the ear they relay in the superior olivary nucleus some of the fibers they cross and finally relay in the finally they relay in the superior olivary nucleus and from the superior olivary nucleus most of the fibers they go by the lateral lemniscal to the inferior colliculus and then they go by the inferior brachium to the medial uh, geniculate body to the middle geniculate body and then these auditory fibers of the fifth or middle in the fifth middle genitalate body are present the fifth order neurons and then they go via the acoustic radiations the fibers the efferents go to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe that is the primary auditory cortex area 41 and 42 if you see that uh, uh, in the thalami it's not it's generally the two way phenomenon if see you can see the fibers coming from the coming from the auditory cortex also to the med middle genitalate body and from the efferents also going from the medial geniculate body to the inferior colliculus and the superior olivary nucleus so it they are a sort of reciprocal innervation innervation but mainly it receives the auditory inputs and then transmits it to the auditory cortex so final it uh, does the processing of the uh, hearing and uh, and this medial geniculate body also has connections with the other thalamic nuclei like pulvinar and and also uh, with the inferior colliculus so it is seen that if there is destruction of even a small part of middle genital body it leads to deafness of a particular band of sound frequency so now uh, we say that thalamus is one of the relay stations so the now we are clear that how the auditory sensations are relayed here auditory sensations are again i repeat relayed in the medial geniculate body from where the fifth order neurons they rise and go by the acoustic radiations into the auditory primary auditory cortex that is the area 41 and 42 of the present in the temporal lobe and if you say you have already studied the hearing and you know that the cochlear nerve cochlear nerve relays mainly in the superior olivary nucleus where and some fibers are crossed and some are not crossed then the fibers they go via the lemniscal the lateral lemniscals to the inferior colliculus and then the fibers finally they relay in the they relay in the middle geniculate body and uh, they relay in the middle geniculate body and this uh, uh, then this mi middle geniculate body finally does the processing of the auditory sensations and then sends into the particular localized area in the cerebral cortex that is the auditory cortex and this is the reason that there is a spatial uh, organized representation of the fibers in the middle geniculate body so this is the reason even if a small part of middle geniculate body is affected a particular band of frequency will be affected and deafness occurs of because of that particular band because there is a proper organized uh, uh, pattern of auditory sensations present over here lateral geniculate body is another relay nucleus it's a very important nucleus of the thalamus mainly concerned with the visual sensations the lateral geniculate body it has divided into it is divided into six layers from layers 1 to layer 6 layers 1 and 2 are containing the larger cells so known as megnocellular and layer 3 and 6 they are smaller cells having smaller cells which are known as parvocellular the layer 1 and 2 it receives fibers from the m ganglion cells of the retina and layers 3 to 6 the parvocellular if you can remember p from the p ganglion cells of the retina so you can remember m for megnocellular that is layer 1 and 2 the m ganglion cells of retina layers 3 to 6 which is formed by the smaller cells parvocellular parvo stands for par p for parvo and p for p ganglion cells of the retina so the efferent uh, here the in the lateral geniculate body the representation is very point to point and the spatial representation is very accurate and the efferents received by lateral geniculate body is it receives fibers from the optic tracts of both the sides optic tracts of 
both the side fibers is received from the both sides of the optic tract and especially the temporal fibers if you see here the temporal fibers of the temporal fibers of the same side which relay in layer 2 3 and 5 and nasal fibers of the opposite side see the nasal fibers of the opposite side they relay in the layer 1 2 and 6 again repeat it receives fibers by the optic tract in which are present the fibers the temporal side that is from the same side they relay in the layer 2 3 and 5 of the lateral geniculate body and the nasal fibers from the opposite side relaying in the layer 1 2 and 6 of the lateral geniculate body it also receives fibers from the superior colliculus superior colliculus is mainly related to the visual sensation so it also receives fibers from the superior colliculus and also from the reticular formation from the reticular formation the especially the different nuclei from the uh, it receives uh, serotonergic fibers from the raphe nucleus and the uh, noradrenergic fibers from locus cerulus of the reticular nucleus and from other areas in pons and medulla it also receives corticofugal fibers from the primary visual cortex so it also receives the fibers from to which it lays so fibers come to the cortico uh, from the primary visual cortex as corticofugal fibers and it helps in processing the visual sensations a very important point is that in the lateral geniculate body the macula has a very larger representation the caudal two third the caudal two third caudal is the posterior the caudal two third is caudal two third is represented by the macula and the rostral one third by the rest of the retina see the macula has a very larger representation over here now the efferents from lateral geniculate body they go to the as optic radiations they go as optic radiations to the visual cortex especially the area 17 and 18 the area 17 and 18 then to also they go to the superior colliculus like come from the superior colliculus go to the superior colliculus pulvinar pulvinar that is the uh, posterior that is the nucleus present in the lateral part then the some areas in the pons and medulla so very important part about this is that the here the what are the functions of this lateral geniculate body you have already done uh, read about the visual sensation so it acts as a relay station for the visual sensation coming from the, the this impulses coming from the ganglion cells to the visual cortex via the parvocellular and magnocellular pathways and these travel through the optic radiation so it's a relay center from the information coming from the ganglion cells of the retina and going to the uh, primary visual cortex via the optic radiations then uh, the important about this is it has high degree of special fidelity special fidelity from retina to visual cortex from retina to visual cortex that is the signals are the special uh, the orientation is maintained from retina to visual cortex and the signals from the two eyes are kept apart the two eyes are kept apart in the this lateral geniculate body moreover the it is also important for visual perception and gating of signals so the corticofugal fibers coming from mainly it receives 80% fibers it receives is from the corticofugal fibers and from other brain areas and only 10 to 20% fibers are from the optic Uh, from the retina so this is important because it controls the visual perception it controls the flow of the signal to the cortex that how much signals from the retina should be sent to the cortex so the this uh, lateral geniculate body has a very important role to play that it is important for the visual processing for the it acts as a relay center and the for the visual processing and getting of signals so that excess bombardment of signals should not be there also to the to the visual cortex now coming to the now talked of the specific relay nucleus the visceral efferent control nuclei will be discussing next 
in this we have uh, mainly the anterior nucleus this is present in the anterior part anterior segment of the thalamus in this anterior nucleus uh, this anterior nucleus it belongs basically to the papaz circuit we'll be studying the papaz circuit papaz circuit in the uh, which is uh, important circuit of limbic system we'll be studying this here and uh, it's a very important component and uh, it is concerned with basically memory and emotions this is concerned with memory and emotions it receives its signals from the hippocampus via fornix and relayed through the relayed through the mammillothalamic tract to the anterior nucleus again repeat papaz circuit which is concerned with the memory and emotions it is uh, this uh, it receives reference from the hippocampus via fornix and the tract is mammillo thalamic tract that is from the basically the mammillary bodies and then the efferents they go to the cingulate gyrus area 24 and uh, of the cerebral cortex so basically again repeat signals from the hippocampus via the fornix relate through the mammillary body by the mammillothalamic tract to the anterior nucleus and then the finally go to the cingulate gyrus to the area 24 important for memory and function we'll be studying this in detail when we talk of uh, the memory and emotion and we'll be come to will realize that this plays a very important role in that the second uh, this uh, front visceral efferent nuclei is the dorsal medial nucleus dorsal medial nucleus which lies in the medial part of the thalamus and uh, this dorsal medial nucleus or what we can say medial dorsal nucleus it is a very important uh, nucleus it has reciprocal connections with the prefrontal cortex reciprocal connections is that it receives efferents from the prefrontal cortex uh, and uh, it is concerned prefrontal cortex and uh, and hypothalamus it receives the efferents from the prefrontal cortex also from the hypothalamus also and uh, also from the olfactory cortex olfactory cortex and amygdala i again repeat it receives reciprocal connections from prefrontal cortex that is reciprocal means efferents and efferents they go both to the uh, they come to the dorsal medial nucleus from prefrontal cortex go to prefrontal cortex and also it has reciprocal connection with the hypothalamus and uh, it uh, it is connected it also uh, connected to the receives input from the olfactory cortex now you have to keep it in mind that almost all the sensations they relay in the thalamus except for the olfactory sensations but olfactory cortex does give reference reference to the dorsomedial nucleus so the it's a very important component which is associated with thinking memory judgment emotions and behavior i again repeat this prefrontal cortex along with dorsomedial nucleus plays a very important role in the behavior of a person especially as far as thinking is concerned the memory is concerned the judgment emotional and behavior so that is the reason it receives its impulses from the amygdala which is a part of the limbic system the hypothalamus again the part of the limbic system and uh, and also from the prefrontal cortex and also from the olfactory cortex and uh, so this olfaction also it is doesn't receive it doesn't play any role in the olfaction as a relay center for olfaction but olfactory cortex sends its signals to the dorsomedial nucleus we have two motor control nuclei the ventral lateral and the ventral anterior nucleus first of all let us discuss the connections of ventral lateral nucleus this is considered one of the main motor nucleus of the thalamus the ventral lateral nucleus is so the efferents it receives is basically from the opposite cerebellar hemisphere via the dentato dentothalamic fibers so basically arises from the dentate nucleus in the cerebellum so that is the reason the, the fibers are called as dentothalamic fibers and then it also receives fibers from the globus pallidus the part of the basal ganglia via the thalamic fasciculus 
then it sends its efferents via the internal capsule to the primary motor cortex that is area 4 primary motor cortex that is area 4 and the premotor cortex that is area 6 of uh, cerebral hemisphere and the main function is it plays a role in relaying the proprioceptive and voluntary motor control functions as this is a motor nuclei so it it helps to relay the proprioceptive and the voluntary motor functions so ventral lateral nucleus is concerned with the relaying of the ventral motor functions so we can say that is like l for ventral lateral lateral m for voluntary motor function and p for proprioceptive so it's sort of a mnemonic you can remember that ventral lateral nucleus after l there is m it plays role in the relaying of voluntary motor functions and then P for proprioceptive and also the proprioceptive functions. The second motor nucleus is the ventral anterior nucleus. The previous one was for what? Do you remember it? It was ventral lateral nucleus and this is the ventral anterior nucleus. So the efferents it receives is from the uh, globus pallidus cerebellum and the substantia nigra which is also the part of the basal ganglia so globus pallidus and substantia nigra they are the part of the basal ganglia it receives fibers uh, from the uh, this uh, substantia nigra globus pallidus which is the part of the basal ganglia and also from the cerebellum and also sends efferents to the premotor cortex that is area 6 it plays role in the programming of movements controlled by the basal ganglia. So, we will be studying basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is involved in programming, planning and programming of movements in association with the cerebral cortex. So, it plays a role in relaying all those uh, in, in, in execution or pro programming of uh, movements controlled by basal ganglia. And here it is written uh, basically like this, but mainly, mainly the ventro anterior nucleus receives impulses from substantia nigra also cerebellum also and globus pallidus of the basal ganglia also then uh, now that let's move to the next part so the association nuclei or the integrative and perceptual function control nuclei that is which integrates all the function as far as perception is concerned are the pulvinar nucleus, the lateral posterior nucleus and the dorsal lateral nucleus. The pulvinar nucleus, it makes up approximately 30% of thalamic volume in human beings and as you must have seen earlier also that this is the posterior flattened portion of the thalamus. So, it con constitutes about 30% of the thalamus, thalamic nuclei. So, one of the largest thalamic nuclei is the pulvinar nucleus. These nuclei are generally higher order function nucleus as compared to the other uh, sensory nuclei. So, they integrate different functions like the function is mainly the role, they play role in language and speech, integrate somatic, auditory and visual information. So, main role is to integrate the different uh, in information as well as vision is concerned, hearing is concerned and somatic together and make it into one and are also important for the language and speech along with other areas or other parts in the brain. The pulmonary nucleus, it receives its afferents from the inferior colliculus. Now, inferior colliculus is mainly concerned with the auditory sensations. It also receives the efferents from the superior colliculus which is all concerned with the movements or the visual movements or vision and moreover it also receives impulses from temporal parietal occipital association areas of the cerebrum and the primary visual area. So again repeat its efferents they come from the primary visual cortex that is the area 1718 as well as the superior colli colliculus both concerned with the vision. Then inferior colliculus concerned with the hearing and then tempor temporal parietal occipital, occipital association areas. We'll be reading about this association areas later on. And then it gives afferents or relays mainly in the parietal occipital temporal association areas. 
receives impulses from here also sends impulses to the same areas and also to the auditory and visual association areas to integrate different auditory and visual informations then the lateral posterior nucleus the other association nucleus it receives afferents also from the superior colliculus and from the parietal lobe of the cerebrum as well as the other thalamic nuclei especially the anterior posterior group of thalamic nuclei so again repeat it receives impulses also from the superior colliculus as well as from the parietal lobe of the cerebrum and the other thalamic nuclei mainly the ventral posterior group of thalamic nuclei now this lateral posterior nucleus it gives its efferents to the again superior parietal lobule impulses coming from parietal lobule lobe but also going to the superior parietal lobule and also to the cingulate and parahippocampal gyrus or the area in the cerebral cortex we will be studying these areas later on when we study the cerebral cortex then the dorsal lateral nucleus which is the third association nucleus or the integrative nucleus it also receives impulses also from the superior colliculus see superior colliculus impulse if the superior colliculus is sending efferents to the all three association nuclei the pulvinal the lateral posterior as well as the dorsal lateral nuclei this dorsal nucleus also in addition receives impulses from the front frontal limbic association cortex so as well as the other thalamic nuclei mainly the anterior and the medial group of thalamic nuclei if you remember the anterior and medial group while the posterior part is receiving from the ventral posterior so you can easily remember the ventral posterior goes to lateral posterior while the anterior and medial they grow to the dorsal lateral then the impulses uh, efferent impulses from this dorsal lateral nucleus go to the parietal lobe as well as the hippocampus so mainly hippocampus is also a part of the limbic area so it does play role in the emotions as well as so language and speech are uh, the function of these nuclei and they play role or play part their part in the maintenance or the function of the human body that is the language and speech so it's not only the language and speech will occur at the main uh, areas in the brain but also the thalamic nuclei play a major role then they integrate the somatic auditory and visual information like the other association areas in the brain they function in collaboration with the parietal occipital temporal association areas as well as the auditory and visual association areas to integrate these functions so this was about the association till now we were discussing the specific projection nuclei of the thalamus we discussed different specific projection nuclei as far well as the specific relay nuclei the motor control nuclei visceral efferent nuclei the association nuclei now we'll talk about the non specific projection nuclei in the non specific projection nuclei that is uh, they do not have a specified areas of projection they project to almost all areas in the cerebral cortex so in this we have three groups the intralaminar nuclei the midline nuclei the reticular nuclei the intralaminar nuclei as i tell, told you earlier that this is present in the internal thalamic thalamic lamina so internal medullary lamina or the internal medullary lamina of the thalamus has the intralaminar nuclei multiple gray uh, 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 their islands are there in the uh, this uh, internal medullary lamina there are multiple nuclei i'll not be discussing those that uh, because it's a large collection of nuclei with different names one of them is the centro median nuclei which is the largest of all and uh, these intralaminar nuclei it receives its efferents from the uh, reticular activating system basal ganglia and other thalamic nuclei so reticular activating system we have discussed this in previous lectures that reticular activating system plays a major role in your arousal and awake state so the reticular activating system mediates the or sends its impulses to the cerebral cortex via the via the intralaminar nuclei if you remember the arousal awake state the base baseline impulses are maintained of these cortex they keep the cortex in an activated state and also the impulses they come from the basal ganglia as well as the other thalamic nuclei 
these intralaminar nuclei they have large somatic receptive fields which are activated by nociceptive and other sensory stimuli and then they project to the prefrontal cortex the neocortex and also they project to the striatum and limbic system i have not mentioned over here but they also project to the striatum and limbic system the responses of intra uh, laminar nuclei are that they are strongly affected by the level of your arousal attention and affect the and affect so that is your basic state of mental state that is how much you are attentive how much you are aroused so its responses dependent upon your mental state so then coming to the midline nuclei if you remember midline nuclei are present in the intra interlaminar interlaminal adhesion inter uh, thalamic adhesions which connect the two lamin uh, two thalami as well as they are present in the located in the wall of the third ventricle because the third ventricle separates the two thalami two thalami and it receives all the ascending fibers all the ascending fibers like spinothalamic trigeminal lemniscus the medial lemniscal the reticular formation they all send impulses to the midline nuclei if you remember the terminations of the nuclei you will remember we talk of midline nuclei then reticular formation also sends impulses to the midline nuclei where then it receives impulses from hypothalamus as well as as well as the other thalamic nuclei so almost all the thalamic nuclei the other thalamic nuclei they relay in all the three nuclei the intralaminar the midline as well as the reticular nuclei then this midline nuclei they also send impulses to the other nuclei as well as the basal ganglia the neocortex and the hypothalamus so wide variety of termination of these nuclei they receive impulses from the other thalamic nuclei give impulses to the other thalamic so there is lot of interconnected connection of thalami thalamic nuclei between other and mainly the these three group of nuclei then uh, the third is this group is the reticular nuclei if you remember reticular nuclei if you remember i told you that this is present in the Uh, slightly lateral in the lateral part of outside the thalamus laterally and it is separated from the thalamus between the external medullary it is separated from the thalamus by the external medullary lamina and it li they lie between the internal external medullary lamina and the internal capsule now these uh, reticular nuclei it has diffuse it receives impulses from the uh, its cerebral cortex as well as and other thalamic nuclei and it sends impulses to the cerebral cortex and other thalamic nuclei basically what happens is these reticular nuclei they have have inhibitory cells their neurotransmitter is gaba they secrete gaba whenever they project to any nuclei like the other thalamic nuclei or the cerebral cortex they secrete gaba which is the inhibitory nuclei it has its reciprocal connection reciprocal means it will receive from the cerebral cortex as well as the impulses will go to the cerebral cortex it has diffuse Uh, reciprocal connection with the entire cerebral cortex and all the thalamic nuclei all the thalamic nuclei seeing reciprocal connections via the collaterals from the corticothalamic and the thalamocortical fibers that is the fibers which come from the cortex to the thalamic corticothalamic or the fibers which go from thalamus to the cortex thalamocortical fibers so exons of now what happens is that the exons of all these non specific nuclei they pass through almost if you see all the areas of cerebral cortex mainly in the layer 1 and 2 of the cerebral cortex as the non specific thalamocortical projections the specific nucleus and the impulses by the specific thalamocortical projections these and they relay in the layer 1 and 2 there are different layers in the cerebral cortex so they relay in layer 1 and 2 of the cerebral cortex so excitation of these fibers that is all these fibers when excited they produce a partial depolarization of the cortical cells keeping them in a state of facilitation that is partial excitation continuously try to understand is that when they send a baseline they send a uh, impulses they uh, these uh, non specific nuclei they send via the thalamocortical projections they sends the continuous impulses 
to the cerebral cortex so because of these impulses these nuclei these uh, these neurons of the cerebral cortex they are kept in a slightly excited state partially facilitated so there is partial depolarization continuously and this is very very important in the maintenance of a wakefulness or arousal they are very very important for your wakefulness and arousal state of mind so again so what are the functions of these uh, non specific thalamo cortical uh, projections via these nuclei there is integration of visceral and uh, sensory especially the intralaminar integration of visceral and sensory information and arousal and alertness the midline mainly the integration of somatic and again visceral information as well as arousal and alertness and the reticular nuclei main function of reticular nuclei is to modulate the thalamic output so it basically modulates the thalamic output what is going out of the thalamus is being modulated by the this reticular we have discussed all the nuclei almost all the nuclei the major nuclei of the thalamus the specific one and the non specific one if you now coming to the functions of thalamus that what are different functions of thalamus i'll try to summarize the major functions of the thalamus i may may forget some but the important ones i'm going to tell you so if you see this uh, thalamus if you see the thalamus see the thalamus has Uh, sorry if you see this uh, cerebral cortex cerebral cortex has impulses the relays from almost all the thalamic nuclei so see this anterior of frontal portion from the dorsalis medial nuclei then uh, when this part by ventral lateral nucleus then this part by the ventro posterior lateral the uh, precentral gyrus ventro posterior lateral then lateral to the whole of the Uh, temporal and row is by the lateral posterior then the uh, pos posterior part or the occipital row by the lateral geniculate body middle geniculate body and the mainly the temporal portion and then the pulvinar and the posterior portions of the uh, this occipital temporal occipital parietal area then inter indeterminate nuclei different nuclei in the temporal lobe see almost all the cerebral cortex all the nuclei they relay in different parts of the cerebral cortex so how so let us now come to the different functions of the thalamus so thalamus acts as a relay center for or station for all the sensory sensations all the sensory sensations like what do you understand by relay center relay center is that like uh, something is being generated somewhere else mainly the things are uh, generated somewhere else like a uh, mm, uh, program is uh, being uh, transmitted by a doordarshan or uh, a channel and then what is happening and then it is relayed then it is relayed by its different relay centers and then it reaches you same is case that all the somatic somatic sensations it receives relays all the somatic sensations from the opposite half of the body this thalamus is basically the important relay station in our body where all the pathways they of the sensory organs while going to the cortex passes through it and this cortex operates in close association with the with the thalamus and can almost always be considered both anatomically as well as functionally to be one unit with the thalamus that is they work together so they coordinate together or they function together the different parts of the cerebral cortex they are connected with the specific parts of the thalamus you can see over here by the thalamocortical system or thalamocortical projections so this is the reason that sometimes the thalamus is also known as the head ganglion of the sensory system the major or the head ganglion of the cerebral uh, sensory system as i told you that almost all the somatic sensations from the opposite half of the body they are relayed in the thalamus while going to the cerebral cortex so what are those uh, somatic sensations we have already read like sense of touch proprioceptive that is sense of position and movement etc they reach via the 
medial lemniscus spinal and the trigeminal lemniscus these are all received by the ventro posterior lateral or the ventro basal complex and via this the pain the temperature the touch and the kinesthetic sensations from different parts of the body and face they reach these nuclei except for the pain except from the pain the all the sensations are released in the relayed in the post central gyrus that is the sensory cortex area 3 1 2 of the cerebral cortex vestibular impulses are related to the temporal lobe vestibular impulses are related to the temporal lobe and this is also connected to the limbic lobe and hypothalamus via the anterior nucleus it is also connected to the limbic lobe and hypothalamus via its anterior nucleus and this play an important role in the autonomic emotional and behavioral responses as well now the impulses uh, coming from the opposite cerebellum it passes to the motor cortex how come the ventral lateral nucleus the ventral lateral nucleus receives cerebellar impulses and relays them to area 4 and 6 of frontal lobe 4 is the area 4 is the motor cortex and 6 of the frontal lobe via via this the cerebellum guides and controls the function of cerebellum so i'm clear that is the opposite cerebellar impulses how do they reach the motor cortex it is via the ventral lateral nucleus which receives its impulses from the cerebellum opposite cerebellum and then relays into the area 4 that is the motor area that is in the precentral gyrus and as well as the area 6 of the frontal lobe via this cerebellum can control or guide the function of the cerebellum then uh, it also receives impulses from the reticular formation so this is the reason that impulses coming from the reticular formation they come as the non specific non specific uh, thalmocortical projections and then they keep as i told you earlier they keep the cerebral cortex in a in a partially awake state because the Uh, the cerebral neurons they are kept in facilitated state and excitatory and these impulses they reach via the reticular system as i told you earlier that it also it is also connected with the basal ganglia so it has inhibitory closed circuit between the basal ganglion and the cortical motor areas so it is a part of this inhibitory closed circuit between the basal ganglia and cortical motor areas in this way it plays a many role in the basic uh, it helps the basal ganglia modulate different movements then as it is connected with the limbic system and hypothalamus as i told you earlier also so autonomic and emotional reactions are also controlled or they play a role in the control of these emotions then it is a relay center for specific sensations like auditory which is via the this medial uh, geniculate body visual by the lateral geniculate body which sends its impulses to the uh, this uh, auditory to the temporal lobe and visual to the uh, occipital lobe and taste sensations except for the olfactory sensations the taste sensations are related to the inferior part of the post central gyrus and this is very very important so if we see that almost all the sensations are relayed in the uh, via the thalamus except for the olfactory sensations olfactory sensations are not relayed in the thalamus they are directly go to the cortex then the third function is processing of information thalamus not only is a great relay center but for all the sensation but it is is a also major center for integrating and modifying the peripheral sensory impulses they are projected to the specific areas of cerebral cortex that is the processing of some sensory information occurs so basically processing of some sensory information occurs so thalamus is concerned uh, is sometimes uh, uh, thought to be the functional gateway of the cerebral cortex in the lower animals the main function of the thalamus is the integration of sensory function while this has been taken over by cerebral cortex in the 
uh, hierarchy because of telencephalization in humans but still some sensations are integrated and modified in the the another function is subcortical perception of some sensations that is perception of some sensations at the subcortical level sensations like pain temperature and crude touch or pressure to some extent are perceived at the level of thalamus the pain sensation is perceived in the thalamus itself pain sensation is perceived in the thalamus itself we have to understand one thing that any sensation it has two components or two qualities any sensation which you perceive like touch pain temperature any sensation it has two components one is the discriminative component and the other is the affective component the discriminative component or the uh, quality nature it is the ability to recognize the type of the sensation the location of the sensations and other details of the sensations and this is the function of cerebral cortex am i clear that is what type of sensation it is where do you feel the sensations and what are the other accompanying details of the sensation this is the role of the cerebral cortex and may and most of the sensations are perceived by this and the cerebral cortex now the second component of the since any sensation is the affective component affective component means that is the capacity to your capacity to determine whether the sensation is pleasant or unpleasant or it is agreeable or disagreeable that is it you like it or you do not like it or uh, this is a good or bad so this now comes the thalamus into picture so the main main the fine uh, component fine component like exactly where you feel the touch it will be the uh, thalamus cortical function but whether the touch is good or bad or you enjoy it or not this is the function of thalamus then the another function of the thalamus is arousal and alertness which i am repeatedly saying that arousal and alertness it receives majority of impulses from the reticular activating system and then sends its impulses to the different parts almost all the parts of the cerebral cortex via the non specific thalamocortical projections and this is involved in controlling the your level of consciousness and maintaining a state of alertness and wakefulness now if you remember in the my lecture of reticular formation i told you that the thalamic neurons are capable of intrinsic spontaneous activity on their own at the rate of about 18 to 13 impulses uh, per second so if there are no impulses coming from the reticular activating system these thalamic uh, neurons via the thalamocortical projections non specific thalamocortical projections will still excite the cortical neurons and contribute to alpha rhythm of the eeg but when facilitatory drive from reticular activating system is strong that is it receives impulses in addition to its intrinsic activity via the reticular activating system the strong the low intrinsic firing of thalamic reticular neuron is reinforced and leading to overall increase in excitability leading to beta rhythm of ecg and that this leads to your arousal shows that you are aroused and elate alert that is your wakefulness or alertness or your conscious level sub your conscious your conscious is depicted by this. the thalamus also play role also plays role in the motor functions you will be surprised to know that we say that thalamus is a major sensory relay organ then how come it controls the motor functions this is at the unconscious basically it goes uh, it regulates at the unconscious level it has unconscious regulation of muscle tone how so it's a part of the it is uh, controls these through its connection with the cerebellum and with the basal ganglia because basal ganglia and cerebellum they also contribute to the control of the motor movements so as it is a part of the motor loop of the brain so 
it receives impulses from the globus pallidus which is the part of the basal ganglia to the uh, vpl nucleus or the ventro posterior lateral nucleus via the pallido thalamic tract that is the globus pallidus a part of the basal ganglia sends impulses to the vpl nucleus of the thalamus via the pallido thalamic tract and then the thalamus via the thalamocortical fibers it goes to the, it sends its impulses to the motor cortex then again the basal ganglia sends its impulses to the vpl nucleus via the pallido thalamic tract its form a type of a motor loop loop that is impulses going from the globus pallidus coming to the thalamus to the motor cortex then basal ganglia then again to the vpl nucleus so it plays role in the postural movements so it influences the postural movements because globus pallid or basal ganglia is involved in the planning and programming of the movements then it also links cerebellum and motor cortex via the dentato rubro thalamocortical tract fibers dentate nucleus is the one of the nuclei of the cerebellum rubro is the red nucleus in the brain we'll be discussing this later on so impulses go from the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum to the red nucleus from the red nucleus the impulses go to the thalamus and from the thalamus the impulses go to the cortex so dentato rubro thalamo cortico tract fibers thus it plays role in the planning and programming of movements so control of postural movements as well as planning and programming of movements via both the basal ganglia and thalamus again repeat it links the basal ganglia by the motor loop of the brain to the cerebral cortex and it links cerebellum and motor cortex via the dentato the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum the red nucleus rubro and the thalamocortical tract fibers so thus it helps in the integration of motor function by unconscious regulation of the muscle tone a very important function while we were discussing the nuclei if you remember when we discussed the association nuclei especially we talked of language and speech mainly the dorsal lateral nucleus is reciprocally connected with the parietal lobe you remember the association nucleus so dorsal lateral nuclei is reciprocally connected with the parietal lobe of the brain and is concerned with the language and speech and complex integrated functions integration between the different cortical parts by subcortical connections in the thalamus it helps in to achieve the speech that is the connection the subcortical connection between the different parts of the thalamus helps to achieve the speech then uh, memory and emotions is again thalamus plays a role we are talking of different nuclei connection with the hypothalamus with the limbic system so subjective feeling of various emotions is being um, thus it act through the subjective feeling of emotion various emotions it acts as a part of the limbic system basically it has connections with the frontal cortex and hypothalamus it has connection with the frontal cortex and the hypothalamus so this is the reason that it forms a part of the limbic system so subjective feeling of various emotions if you remember i told you that the uh, sensations and emotions they have a different component uh, sensations they have different uh, two components so the affective component is that is related to emotions and memory this is the function of thalamus then anterior thalamus it forms part of the papes circuit the papes circuit will be discussing in the basal ganglia and this papes circuit and uh, uh, it receives its inputs from the mammalothalamic tract from the it is it receives its input via the mammalothalamic tract from the mammillary body of the limbic system and which is concerned with the recent memory and emotions recent memory and emotions it is concerned with the recent memory your recent memory and the emotional component is is because of the impulses coming from the mammillary body via the mammalothalamic tract which is a part of the papes circuit emotional reactions like that of the rage are mediated at the level of through thalamus that is the rage your one of the emotions is rage anger 
so its connection with the hippocampus and amygdala aids in differentiation of the functioning of recollective and familiarity memory so as it is connected to the hippocampus and amygdala hippocampus and amygdala are again part of the limbic system so with the help of this it helps in differentiation of the function of recollective memory and familiarity familiarity memory there are different type of memory when we discussing the memory will come to know what are different types of memories then it plays a major role in sleep um, the circuits linking the thalamus cortex via the thalmocortical loop they not only play role in the motor movements but also important in generating the pattern of brain activity in sleep wake cycle sleep wake cycle the uh, reticular thalamic nuclei it has a major role to play the inhibitory thalamic reticular nuclei are part of the neuronal network that cause induction of sleep we'll be discussing sleep we'll come to know the their role played by these nuclei see thalamic nu reticular nuclei are also considered as the pacemaker of the sleep spindle so we'll be when we will discussing ecg as well as we'll be seeing there are certain um, recordings when we record the sleep activity we record certain spindles and sleep spindles and these are the thalamic reticular thalamic nuclei are considered to be the pacemaker which induces these sleep spindles during sleep one thing is that the thalamic nuclei stop relaying sensory information to the brain so but continues to produce signals that are sent to the cortical projections so so it basically balances it inhibits it decreases its impulses the sensory information to the brain it sends decreases the impulses because you know that arousal awake state is maintained by the uh, this non specific thalmocortical projections also then it plays role in the synchronization of electroencephalogram or ecg so it has been seen that the stimulation of intralaminal thalamic nuclei uh, is plays role in the synchronization of eeg eeg is basically electrical recording of the brain we'll be discussing this so stimulation of intralaminal nuclei at low frequency causes synchronization of ecg waves recorded from the ipsilateral cortex this is called as recruiting response you record from the ipsilateral cortex that is same side cortex while if high frequency stimulation is there it causes arousal and desynchronization so am i clear low frequency stim uh, stimulation will cause synchronization and high frequency will cause arousal and desynchronization synchronization eeg is basically the recording of your cortical neurons so it tells you basically the cortical activity so low frequency will um, cause the synchronization and uh, high active high uh, uh, intensity will cause desynchronization that is awake arousal state sensory motor coordination we talked of sensory function of the thalamus we talked of motor function of the thalamus now the coordination it does have a role to play in the coordination of sensory motor function thalamus receives almost all the sensory inputs from the body and closely interacts with the basal ganglia and cerebellum and motor cortex for the motor cortex cortical functions so uh it coordinates between sensory and motor function especially in the sensory feedback for correction and improvement of motor output that is whatever the sensory feedbacks is required for the correction in further improvement of motor output this thalamus plays a part because it has close association with the cerebellum as well as the basal ganglia now the integration of visceral and somatic functions it's not only the sensory motor in coordination but also the integration of visceral and somatic functions we know that it has relations with the uh, thalam hypothalamus and so it also plays role in the autonomic sensation so it receives somatic as well as autonomic sensations and is also connected with the hypothalamus so it acts as a center for integration of visceral and somatic sensations so because it is receiving the sen somatic sensations it is connected with the visceral sensation and then it is connected with hypothalamus so it does play a role in integration of this then it is considered to be a center for reflex activity as well as the sexual sensation so it forms a center for many reflex activities so now we have uh, discussed or summarized almost the major functions of the thalamus
let us discuss some abnormality of the thalamus the major abnormality of the thalamus is the though rarest but the major one is the thalamic pain syndrome what we call as gerin rausi syndrome here the damage to the thalamus may be associated with an peculiar overreaction to painful stimuli that is due to damage of the thalamus there is a over sensitivity to the pain reaction or over over reaction to the painful stimuli what is the cause of what is the cause of thalamic pain syndrome is that it can occur because of blockage which can occur because of thrombosis atherosclerosis or due to injury of thalamo geniculate branch of posterior cerebral artery this is a small artery thalamo geniculate branch or is a small branch of posterior cerebellar artery which supplies the posterior ventral thalamic area where is is present the vpl nucleus or the ventro posterior lateral nucleus so in because of this damage to the ventro posterior nucleus the uh, entero posterior lateral nuclei or nucleus we have the typical overreaction of the pain because the medial and nuclei are not destroyed it's only the mainly this nucleus is destroyed so rather they are facilitated and there is enhanced sensitivity of pain and effective perception of pain so again repeat it is somewhat damage to the thalamus may be associated with an abnormal overreaction to the painful stimuli because occurs because of the artery to the vpl nucleus or the ventro posterior nucleus which is the thalamogenuclear branch of the posterior cerebral artery is is blocked due to either there is thrombosis there is atherosclerosis or damage and while the medial nuclei are not destroyed they are rather facilitated they become hyperactive and and then there is enhanced sensitivity of pain and effective perception patient of thalamic syndrome has a peculiar uh, sign and symptoms peculiar sign and symptoms symptoms are what the patient tells to you and signs are what you see in the patient or what you uh, elicit so am i clear now symptoms are the complaint of a disease which the patient comes to with which the patient comes to you and signs are what you yourself see in the patient or elicit in the patient so there are certain uh, immediate and certain delayed one of the immediate uh, signs and symptoms are contralateral hemianesthesia contra means opposite that is opposite half of the body and hemi means half contra opposite half of the body has loss of sensation so there is numbness of almost all the sensations except for temporary loss of those sensations which have bilateral representations like the sensations of crude touch which is uh, transmitted by the th spinothalamic tract but this touch but there will be no localization and the threshold will be very high again repeat there is numbness with temporary loss of especially the all the sensations with bilateral representation mainly the crude touch and there will be no localization like you see in the fine touch and the threshold will be high then the postural sensations sense sensation of fine touch tactile localization and discrimination are completely lost completely lost and there is stereognosis stereognosis that is you are not able to make out the shape of any object or shape because you are not able to um you, know, you lose the patient loses fine touch tactile localization and discrimination so this is the reason he gets stereognosis that is loss of the uh, sensations or you can ascertain the shape of an object with the help of the touch sensation another important feature of thalamic syndrome is ataxia ataxia that is in coordination of movements and this type of ataxia is sensory ataxia and occurs in the opposite side of the body uh this occurs why does it occur it occurs because of loss of position and kinesthetic signals normally which occur which go via the thalamus to the cortex that is there is loss of sensory feedback to the sensory cortex you remember we talked of that it plays a role in the sensory feedback so so there is loss of position and kinesthetic signals in the form of uh, sensory feedback from the thalamus going to the sensory cortex they are lost so the there is sensory ataxia 
and there is in coordination of movements then the another important uh, feature is hypotonia decreased muscle tone and profound muscle weakness then there are certain delayed effects which occur over a period of few weeks few weeks to few months now after some time what happens in such a patient some sensory perception on the opposite half of the body is recovered if you remember i told you that the sensations which are bilaterally represented like crude touch they recover then a very important uh, component is that the uh, and moreover when they recover there are the threshold to these stimuli is higher after some time the, there is the patient develops suddenly thalamic overreaction what is this thalamic overreaction is that is the threshold for pain touch and temperature are now decreased and they are exaggerated and unpleasant again repeat that the threshold for pain touch and temperature it is decreased and the sensation is exaggerated and it is unpleasant and sometimes even the non uh, non painful stimulus will elicit the pain there is a typical lancinating pain of pain type of pain that is the sharp pain lancet is basically lens is a long uh, very thin sharp sword so that is why with that thin sword pricks you that type of pain is felt is the lancinating pain so regardless of the type of the stimulus is applied to the body the pain thresh, the pain felt is very unpleasant and even non painful stimuli like touch can also produce pain why because the of loss of inhibition on the midline or the non specific nuclei by the vpl nucleus as the mechanoreceptive sensations are going up they cause some collateral or some degree of lateral inhibition which is lost when the vpl nucleus is destroyed so vpl nucleus sends some sort of inhibitory impulses to these nuclei so these nuclei they come over out of those inhibitions and then what you feel is you feel the pain this burning pain fibers basically go to the anterior medial nucleus so so there is sort of overreaction to the pain so your face even with a low threshold stimulus the pain is very very much sharp uh, unpleasant and exact another very uh, what i was saying that even the non painful stimuli can produce pain and this is known as allodynia what do you mean by allodynia allodynia is that even any non painful stimulus can produce pain so the patient also has allodynia i already told you the causes loss of inhibition on midline or non specific nuclei by the vpl nucleus so they come out of that inhibition and produce a sensation of pain then there is dysesthesia dysesthesia is an unpleasant abnormal sense of touch so when you touch a patient he doesn't feel a normal sense of touch but he the touch the patient feels is abnormal then he perceives many affective sensations of extreme unpleasantness or really extreme pleasantness that is sometimes what has what what happens is suddenly the same stimulus may be very pleasant to him extremely pleasant and the same may be extremely unpleasant to her to him or her that is he perceives many affective sensations so of the uh, sensation the person is like to this is uh, the unpleasant sensations are emo associated with emotional triads it is believed that since the medial nucleus are not destroyed they become facilitated and give rise to the enhanced sensitivity of pain and transmitted through the reticular system as well as the affective perception is because of these nuclei then another very important thing is thalamic phantom limb what is this thalamic phantom limb that is a patient is unable to locate when the patient closes his eye with the closed eye patient is unable to locate the position of the limbs that is what we tell we tell the patient to close his eye and try to locate his limb normally you can easily locate your limb because of the presence of kinesthetic sensations but because of the loss of kinesthetic sens sensations he is not able to uh, locate his limb and this is known as phantom limb he th thinks that his limb is absent like the phantom was a character in the um, uh, comics in our times when the he, the person was invisible that is why they known as than thalamic phantom limb then there is amelogenesis amelogenesis that illusion uh, the same thing that illusion of the felt by the patient of absence of his or her limb this is again because of loss of kinesthetic sensation so phantom limb or uh, loss of limb or he has 
is an illusion that is it doesn't have is another very important uh, feature of uh, thalamic syndrome is involuntary movements so you have to keep in uh, one thing into consideration that when we are talking of different signs and symptoms it is not a must that all the signs and symptoms will be present in a single patient of thalamic syndrome it can be that some of the signs and symptoms might be present and some might not be present so another important is involuntary movements so what are different type of involuntary movements which you can encounter in a patient of thalamic syndrome one is intention tremor that is at rest the patient doesn't have any tremors but when he starts doing any work there is an intention tremor the intention tremor has multiple causes one of the causes is the thalamic syndrome and because it has function relation with the cerebellum so cerebellum so uh, because of this uh, the thalamic syndrome patient has a intention tremor then there can be multitude of other involuntary uh, movements which are almost opposite to it like chorea chorea is uh, quick jerky movements while adenosis is uh, slow writhing and twisting movement like you see when the worm is moving that is the jerky and writhing movement so so they are both opposite sort of movements but they can occur one of the these can occur because of the involvement of fibers from globus pallidus then there is thalamic hand or ethytoid hand this is a particular type of hand sometimes seen in a thalamic patient when there is uh, we can see that there is moderate flexion of the wrist with hyper extended fingers that is slightly the wrist is uh, flexed but the fingers are hyper extended then how will you treat such a patient because all the damage you cannot recover the damage so in this the most common treatment plan are that you involve a schedule of physical therapy that is a physiotherapy with the symptomatic treatment with the modification medication regime or the symptomatic treatment here the simple analgesic will not be able to uh, treat the neuropathic pain which is very excruciating so you need the a uh, special type of analgesics like you can give opiates like morphine codeine papaverine different variety of opiates are available you can use them strong uh, and these are strong analgesics then because the emotional components are involved you can use antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants or what we call as tca the commonest one is amitriptyline then you can add anticonvulsants like gabapentin and then local lidocaine patches can be given to remove the pain even sometimes the electrode stimulation electrode stimulation can be electrodes can be implanted in the thalamus and then stimulated to decrease the pain so this can also be so there are uh, multiple uh, abnormalities uh, associated with thalamus but i'll not be talking very much with is not um, whatever important applied part was why i already gave to you but i want to tell you something about the uh, thalamus nowadays the thalamus is uh, being used for different uh, treatments in different modalities like treatment of seizures treatment of intentional tremor the pain so this uh, one of the important thing is that it has been seen that when there is bilateral stimulation of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus for uh, epilepsy and uh, that this is known as sante this can lead to reduction in seizures and in majority of the patients especially in those patients where the they are uh, the their seizures are partial to the treatment uh, their seizures are partially refractory to the treatment what i mean to say is that the seizures are not being able to uh, stopped with the help of the medicines so in addition to the medicines what we give is we implant the electrodes in the anterior thalamus of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and try to stimulate and then try to reduce the amount of seizures and this has been successfully done in certain studies then if it is the thalamic pathology thalamic pathology is been implicated in coma and related disorders of consciousness if you remember the function of thalamus thalamus then if you remember the functions of thalamus we talked of that it plays role in wakefulness and alertness so obviously when there is a defective uh, or defect in the thalamus it is going to affect the com defect to affect the consciousness of the patient and can lead to coma and very important uh, thing is frontal lobectomy what is frontal lobotomy is that certain sometimes what we do is for relief of intractable pain the connections between the dorsal nucleus of the thalamus and the frontal lobe are surgically cut so the person will now feel pain but there will be no disagreeable response that is effective emotional component will be lost and with the help of frontal lobectomy then 
nowadays the upcoming treatment for intention tremor uh, this essential intention tremor or the tremors uh, for the essential tremors uh, the tremors associated with basal ganglia or, or uh, this parkinson disease it has been seen that the uh, if we stimulate certain nuclei of the thalamus electrodes are implanted in the thalamus and they are stimulated lot of uh, this uh, tremors can be decreased and this is going on in certain institutes especially in uh, specialized institutes this is going on with this i finished thalamus and uh, i hope uh, you enjoy the session if you have any queries you can feel free to contact me